far as I'm concerned, I call it pussycat football. They either play offense or they either play defense. Last of pro football's two-way players, my next guest is the epitome of what an all-time football player should be. Please welcome Chuck Bednarik. Hi, Chuck. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, is football uh, for you, does it still hold a big place or is it something that's as time goes on? As far as I'm concerned, I call it pussycat football. They either play offense or they either play defense. They weigh 300, 310, 320. They couldn't play two-way football. They now, couldn't play two-way football. Now take me back, uh, 1949, you're the first pick of the draft, okay? Now uh, you just came from a war and you're a young guy did they put everything on you as the man like they do today when you're the number one pick or was it? No, things have changed drastically and that's, I, I could accept that very much. No, I, uh, during World War II I was a gunner on a B-24, flew 30 missions over Germany. The Nazis missed me 30 times. So, and that was uh, something that was just honored recently, right? Yeah, they just had an honor for you? at the Hall of Fame. Oh, okay. So they, the they honored you actually at the Pro Football Hall of Fame? Yes, for yes, they honored me. I, w I wound up with five air medals and five battle stars. I was a 19-year-old kid. Right. <laughs> you know? And now you come back and uh, you go into professional football. No, I, and I came back. I had the GI Bill of Rights. And the first guy I went to see was my high school football coach at Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And I said, Coach, I got the GI Bill of Rights. Where should I go to college? And immediately he said, the University of Pennsylvania. I looked at him. I said, where is it? You know, a lot of people don't know where it is. They think Penn State, Pennsylvania. The University of Pennsylvania is in Philadelphia. And of course, that's where I went. And when I got there, the coach was George Munger. And I told him I was going to come in. And he looked at me and he said, go up there and take the rent exam. He was so anxious because he had just a bunch of kids. Now, here I am, a guy that was in a war and all. I'm 20 years, 21 years old. So it was just like that, you know, to make the team, all I had to do was throw my jock on the field and it was no problem. And I'm very delighted and happy that I went to the University of Pennsylvania. Right. It's a nice Ivy League school and you get an education. I was there not only to play football, I got an education. So now at the University of Pennsylvania, is the goal to play for the Eagles? Is that something that's on your head? Or? Well, pro football, believe it or not, back in those days was not, not in its infancy, but it wasn't really up to too far. The Eagles were in town and lo and behold when the draft came they happened to get what they call a bonus pick and they picked me first. And let me tell you back then I got a ten thousand uh, dollar bonus and a twenty thousand dollar contract. Today you're talking millions. And is that what bothers you the most? Yeah. The salaries? Overpaid, underplayed. God almighty I can't I, it, it bugs me. No. Now, when we when we first started doing this show, we wanted to make it an approach of the younger generation. And uh, when we first talked about people, uh, some people were surprised that we picked Chuck Bednarik to actually be on. But uh, I think that it's it's probably that we're missing too much of what went on in the past that's creating uh, so much of what goes on today. Do you think there's any changes we can do to get it back to the old time ways? Or no, it's just going to be it's going to remain the way it is right now. The kids are either going to be on offense or defense. And I would love to see somebody that's going to stay on the field, linemen, not running backs, let them run. But the guys on the line, let them stay on the field, by golly. In today's uh, day and age with the, the uh, places that they play on, do you think it's possible with injuries that you can do that over a long career still? Nah, I don't think so. You know, when I was playing my days, Today, I think the average line line on offense and defense is close to 300. Yeah, it has definitely changed. That's one of the aspects and, uh, that's you know changed what? the most. And oh, these, these guys are so overweight and everything. They ain't worth, to my opinion, they ain't worth a damn. <laughs> but now, 
as far as the, the way the NFL is marketed today and uh, how they look for headlines, was that something that you had to deal with back when you first came in? Or was it the press and the media kind of left you alone? And in my days, the, the, the pro football was not where it is today. Right. It was more or less, let's say it was just out of its infancy. By golly, uh, pro football in those days was nothing. Well, that's a good point because you're in your infancy and now uh, they come and they're trying to market it so they pick select players, uh, obviously the marketable players, and now here you are in, in a championship game which everybody's become famous that uh, Frank Gifford was, was, was hit hard on the last play and, and uh, you know they made the, the famous picture out uh, mm -hmm. that you were celebrating. Now it's been clear cut that obviously that, that's not what you were doing the end of the game. Uh, was over and you're just celebrating that the victory is done. But what I wanted to know is, is it because of the media? Did the media turn that and try to make it like villainized and, and go with the press with the story? Or was it more innocent back in those days and it just kind of happened like that? Are you talking about the Frank Gifford yeah, incident? Yeah, the Frank Gifford hit. Did the media create that more than, than it was? You know, first of all, Frank played in New York. And Which is Market City, isn't that's, it? That's, no? anything happens, it happens in New York, right. and he was the glamour boy right. here. Hell, and of course, I, what I did, I hit him so perfectly, head on, like a Mack truck hitting a Volkswagen, and he fumbled the ball on our six yard line, and we recovered, and that's the last time the Eagles were world champions on that play. That's the last time, that's when the concrete Charlie curse came and in, is that correct? You know, in his book, <laughs> his wife, Kathy Lee, she said, Chuck Bednarik, what's that, a pasta? <laughs> she called me a pasta. Is that what she called you? And I looked at the camera, I've never which seen I'm a looking at right now. Like that. I wish it was you on the end of that shot instead of Frank. Wow, so there's some bad blood there between Oh, right. well, what the heck's the matter with her? And how about Regis? Everything's okay with Regis, though, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. Sure. So now, uh, let me finish by saying that there is a curse in Philadelphia that, that people believe is going on today called the Curse of Concrete Charlie. And they have been struck by some injuries and they have not won a championship since that game you talk about. You know, uh, uh, should we be waiting to get the Eagles fans uh, ready or is that we're not ready? You know, first of all, I want to say, how did I get the nickname Concrete Charlie? I don't know, how did you get that? Well, in, in those days, we got a job in the off season and I happened to work for a big company that had five plants and 200 concrete trucks. And construction in the 60s was big in those days. And I, after practice in the morning, I went out, had my lunch, and I worked and I was selling concrete. And that's how I got the nickname. They said he's as tough as the concrete that he sells. And that's, they nicknamed me, nicknamed me Concrete Charlie. And I love it. And you know, the good. funny part about it is a lot of people don't know the difference between cement and concrete. Oh, he fell on the cement. Well, I cemented it, but that's concrete. If it was cement, that's powder. You could live. But concrete, you might hit your head and die. Absolutely. That's the that's difference. Why there's so many people and I want these people to know right? that the difference between cement and concrete is one is powder and the other is the hard stuff. So they give you the cement <laughs> nickname when you're in high school, but to get the concrete one, you got to be yeah. the man. All right, so tell me about today. What are you doing today? Does football play a part in your life? Or? No, I, I just stay at home. I'm, I, I'm at a certain age where I couldn't care less. I, I, well, let me just tell you about my lifestyle to begin with. I'm of Catholic faith, and I happen to go to church mass every day. I go to bed at 8.30, 9 o'clock at night. I'm up at 5.30, quarter to 6, have my coffee and donuts or hard-boiled eggs. Mass starts at 8 o'clock. It takes me 12 minutes to get there. It's over in 25 minutes. I'm home at 8.30. Now you, I remember you made a quote, and it's been a favorite quote of mine for a while. I'm going to have to paraphrase it, but I, I believe you said everything that you needed to do is done, and the only thing left is heaven, correct? You know, that's correct. I, again, I'm going to reiterate that uh, no matter what your religion is, I happen to be a Catholic. And in my pocket right now, I wouldn't walk out of my house without a pair of rosaries. Yes, I, there is a heaven and there is a hell. And 
somehow, somewhere, I'm getting, you're going upstairs. And that's what I want to do. Well, I, I can relate to that. I understand exactly what you're saying. I am the same faith. But now, let me ask you, in today's world, is it harder to instill that kind of faith attitude in the kids and your grandchildren? Is it, it's, it's more of an uphill climb than it was, right? Oh, yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, this is a tough, wild, crazy world we live in. It is. No it question about, about it. it. And, and, and as far as people and kids and religious, on a Sunday, they don't want to go to church. They want to sleep. Right. Heck, right. that's the wrong, that's the wrong attitude. And do you think that uh, you, you've had, you've always been a man of faith even as, as a young boy. Do you think that that has helped you throughout life to get where you are today? No ands, ifs, or buts. No questions, right? I, I went to a parochial school with the nuns teaching us, but when they were tough, gee, they knocked the hell out of us sometime. And then, of course, I've been a Catholic all my life, and I'm happy and proud to say that I am. And tomorrow, when I get out of here, I know it'll be late when I get home, but I'm going to go to church tomorrow morning. Excellent. <laughs> well, I th I'll tell you, uh, you, you're definitely a, a model for both generations to look up to, and it, it's certainly been a pleasure, and I, I thank you so much for coming to join us. And I think anybody who wants to get involved, uh, even on a little level of watching professional football, should should look up what it was like back in the, in the golden days. And right here, Chuck Begnarek is about uh, as big as you get. This is the man that epitomizes professional football. Thank you. Thank you.